you open your Bibles tonight to Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4, as we are finishing up our gospel study with the first book in the gospels, book of Matthew. Chapter 4, the temptation of Jesus. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And the temper came in, tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you. And on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against the stone. Jesus said to him, again it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. And again the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these I will give you if you'll fall down and worship me. And Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, the angels came and ministered to him. You know, we've talked that there many things that we can learn from uh, other denominations. And I have a friend, he's very much of Reformed theology, and he had a, pe uh, a podcast a while back. And the podcast was this very important question that many in Reformed theology and Reformed churches ask many times when you study scripture. A very, very important question. And that question is, so what? So what? And this is one, a question that we really should be asking ourselves. When we read scripture, what does this mean? So what? How is this applicable to my life? How would God want me to apply what I've just read to my life? Now, we absolutely believe that scripture is inspired and there is only one meaning of scripture. There is only one interpretation, but there are many applications that we can pull from scripture. Because scripture is alive, the Holy Spirit can reveal to us applications of scripture of how these things can be applied to our lives. And this truly happens in like three different levels, three different ways. It can happen individually. When you're in God's word and you're walking by the spirit, God can speak directly to you through his word. He can do this through others where you're going through something and because we believe in body life and that we believe the importance of fellowship and bearing each and every one's other's burdens and coming together and praying against things, he uses others that you may be completely oblivious to what might be the application of the word of God in this struggle of my life. But there is someone that comes to you and they share an application of scripture that is just what you need. And then also through shepherding, we believe that God has placed pastors over churches to be a shepherd to the body, to preach messages, to preach messages to the body. I believe absolutely when we read about prophecy in scripture and prof prophecy in today's world, 
in the New Testament times. It's not foretelling. It's not fortune telling, but it is just like what it was in the Old Testament. It was forth telling. It was bringing God's message to the body. And that's what each and every pastor, whether they say that there is no gift of prophecy or not, they are prophesying over their body as they're put there as a shepherd over their body. They are prophesying, they are forth telling a message to their body that they are put as shepherd over. One application I believe we can take from this portion we just read. It could be applied to our decision making. Jesus shows us by example here of how a believer can make good decisions. You know, we were just talking, um, you know, in our short little wrap before our message tonight about decisions we make and volitional choices we make. And definitely teens and children and adults, we all have to make decisions in our lives. And all our decisions will lead to an outcome. Every single one of them. They will result in something. Every decision we make. In gun safety classes, they always teach you this. That any time that you fire a gun, that projectile will always hit something. Any time a gun is fired, there is a consequence for it. There is not a bullet that's ever been fired that has not hit something once it's fired. And in the same way, there has never been a decision anyone has ever made that did not result in something. There was a result to the decision. And many times the conditions of our life are decisions that we've made, decisions that others have made, because our decisions we make do not just affect us, but they also affect those around us. And truly all problems, all issues that we are facing in the world today are the results of decisions someone has made. So as Jesus was faced by the tempter, how did he decide? Verse three, and when the tempter came to him, he said, if thou be the son of God, command these stones to be made bread. Jesus had a decision to make. Would he live to feed his body or would he rely on the Father? Verse four, but he answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And this is our first key to good decision making. Our decisions have to be made by every word of God. We cannot just make a decision on a Bible verse. Our decisions have to be from the whole counsel of the Word of God. We make this a very important point, especially on Wednesday nights as Tyler teaches through systematic doctrine, that our doctrines line up not with just this verse or that word, verse, but they are systematic in complying with the entire Word of God. Because it's not what my thoughts are or what I think this means. What matters is, is what God's thoughts on the matter is. Verse six, and he said unto him, if thou be the son of God, cast thyself down for it is written, he shall give his angels charge concerning thee and in their hands they shall bear thee up lest at any time thou shalt dash thy foot against the stone. We have to be on guard. 
The devil will twist scripture to fit his purposes. And this is why we believe in body life. This is why believe, we believe there is a pastor that shepherds his church. This temptation was to put God to the test. And in verse seven, Jesus said unto him, it is written again, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. This comes to our second key of good decision making. When we make decisions, we do not tempt God. If we decide to do something, well, we know that we should be in preparation for something else. Like a child that decides to play video games instead of studying for a test. Or a person in business that procrastinates and leaves his projects done to the last. Don't think if you're going right before a test, if you pray five minutes before the test, that God is going to magically download the answers into your brain. Because God has created man with the ability to make choices. We have free will or free volition. And if we decide to go against God's plans, his principles, his laws, don't think he will go against your will. You will have consequences for your decisions. Now God is capable, he's gracious to restore those who repent, but we do not put God to the test by making bad decisions and believe that he is a pass card for when we need it. Verse eight, again the devil taketh him up unto an exceedingly high mountain, and he sheweth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. And he said unto him, all these things I will give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Jesus had the decision of who he will worship. And we ask this also, who are we going to serve? Is it myself? Is it serving the devil or satanic purposes? Or do we make this decision to serve God? Verse 10, then saith Jesus unto him, get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shall thou serve. And this is our third key of godly decision making. Our third key. Our decision has to be to serve God. We make decisions that do not reduce our worship or our service to God. There are three, three areas that we can place our worship. There is satanic worship. This is the iniquity we were talking about. It is to truly wish or to align with evil to prevail. We were talking about political affiliations earlier today. And how could Christians align with certain political parties that want to bring death or violate the very laws of nature that God has put forth? How could we align with these things? It is truly satanic worship. There is self-worship. We read about this all the time. It is idolatry that we read about in the Old Testament. The idols were more than just little statues. Behind every idol there was something that served the person, whether it be fame, whether it be fertility, whether it be money, whether it be power and strength in war. That's what the idolatry of the Old Testament was. And very present today, we don't carry around little idols. But those things like money, fame, power, these self-serving idols still are very active in our culture today. 
And then finally, we worship God. And there is the biggest decision everyone has to make. As Joshua said, in jo as it says in Joshua 24, 15, choose this day whom you will serve. There was a decision made by Adam and Eve that brought sin upon every man and woman. But there was one man that was born without son, sin, the very Son of God, Jesus. His death, death paid for all our sins. And in his death, he was raised to give new life to us, that we would grow in the grace and knowledge of God. And it's by taking and placing your faith in Jesus Christ that not only he gives you new life, but he gives us eternal life with him. Verse 12. Now when he heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew unto Galilee. And leaving Lazarus, he went and he lived in Capernaum by the sea in the ter territory of Zebulun and Naphtali so that what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, the way of the sea beyond Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light. For all those dwelling in the region of the shadow of death, on them the light has dawned. From that time, Jesus began to preach saying, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. I realize that in dispensational circles there's a lot of debate over the difference between the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God. And I'd like to read something from uh, gotquestions.org. In my personal view is the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God are synonymous. And this is from gotquestions.org. While some believe the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven are referring to different things, it is clear that both phrases are referring to the same thing. The phrase kingdom of God occurs 68 times in 10 different New Testament books, while the kingdom of heaven only occurs 32 times, and only in the Gospel of Matthew. Based on Matthew's exclusive use of the phrase and the Jewish nature of his Gospel, some have interpreted, some interpreters have concluded that Matthew was writing concerning the Millennial Kingdom, while the other New Testament authors were referring to the Universal Kingdom. However, a closer study of the use of this phrase reveals that interpretation and error. For example, speaking of the rich young ruler, Christ uses the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God interchangeably. Then Jesus said to his disciples, I tell you the truth, it is harder for the rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Matthew 19, 23. And in the next verse, Christ proclaims, again I tell you it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. Verse 24, Jesus makes no distinction between the two terms, but seems to consider them synonymous. Mark and Luke use the kingdom of God, where Matthew uses the kingdom of heaven frequently in parallel accounts of the same parables. And I've got a list of parables uh, and scriptures that you could cross-reference if you'd like. And each time, in each instance, Matthew uses the phrases kingdom of heaven, while Mark and Luke use kingdom of God for the very same teachings. Clearly, the two phrases refer to the same thing. Verse 18. While walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going from there, he saw two other brothers, James the son of Zebedee and John his brother, in the boat 
with Zebedee their father, mending their nets, and he called them immediately. They left their boats and their father and followed him. In our introduction to Matthew, we pointed out that Matthew was a very hated person. He was a Levite that was trained in scripture, trained in what Israel was supposed to be, and he was working for the Roman government to collect taxes. And nobody likes a tax collector, not even today. He was hated by the Jews because they felt he knew better. And the tax collectors were notorious for being very harsh, very dishonest. In the culture of their day, the tax collectors were the lowest of the low. But this book of Matthew does not just show how even the lowest of the low, but the profane, the common man, are also called. Peter, Andrew, James, and John, they were commoners. They were the working class guys. They were the blue collar workers. They were quintessential Central Jews of their day. But the message of this book of Matthew is not how bad or how common you have to he be to hear the call of God, but that there is a call, that there is a call. And just like James, John, Peter, Andrew, and Matthew, you hear that call and you follow. Verse 23, and he went throughout all of Galilee teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction among the people. So the fame spread throughout all Syria and they all brought him all the sick, those afflicted with various diseases and pains those oppressed by demons, those having seizures, the paralytics, and he healed them. And great crowds followed him from Galilee, Decapolis, and from Jerusalem and Judea, and from beyond the Jordan. How do we build the church? How do we build the church? We don't. There's not anything that we can do through marketing, through advertising, that we can do to truly build the church. But just as Matthew, James, John, Peter, Andrew, what happened? They followed Jesus. They followed him. And just as the disciples followed him, then a great crowd followed him. We do nothing to build the church. We follow Jesus. Jesus will do the great work, then others will follow. 